without records, there isn't any history. And without history, there isn't any memory. And without memory, there isn't any motivation. It's been called the single most significant historical project of our time, the Joseph Smith Papers. Now, as part of that project, two years of television documentaries were produced by Larry and Gail Miller in cooperation with the Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith's life, his teachings, his papers were explored. And it was fascinating. It was a wonderful experience. So much so that we intend to pick it up right where we left off. But first, see if you remember some of these scenes from the Joseph Smith Papers. Providentially speaking, it's a great moment when the prophet of the Restoration is sent to earth. But as Lucy described it, it was not such an important event after all. She gives just two sentences to Joseph Smith's birth. In the meantime, we had a son whom we called Joseph. I will speak of him more particularly by and by. And that was all. 1816. The Smith family started over in Palmyra, New York. It was here in 1820 that Joseph Smith saw the father and the son. Now, President Hinckley made a statement. He says, we declare without equivocation that God the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, appeared in person to the boy Joseph Smith. Our whole strength rests on the validity of that vision. It either occurred or it did not occur. If it did not, then this work is a fraud. If it did, then it is the most important and wonderful work under the heavens. He receives the plates from the angel. He buries the plates in the woods. He leaves them in a hollow log, he says. But he brings back with him the seer stones, what we call Urim and Thummim. And here, Harmony, Pennsylvania, while translating the Book of Mormon, the priesthood was restored to the earth. On May 15th, uh, Joseph and Oliver uh, decide to go and pray. And Joseph says, that they went aside from the abodes of men. Uh, he and Oliver both say they went to the woods to pray. Uh, they didn't go out in a public area. Uh, the only woods uh, that was on his property was on the north end of Joseph's farm. If that's where he went, it would have been up in where they had maple groves uh, in a more secluded area, uh, away from the home, away from the busy river. Joseph identifies the Susquehanna area as the place where the Melchizedek priesthood came. And as a result of that, we would have to say it came before they moved to the Whitmer farm on June 1 of 1829. Joseph and Oliver completed the translation of the Book of Mormon in the summer of 1829. It was here that the book was printed. Normally in those days, people only printed a few hundred copies of a book. And to print 5,000 was extraordinary. In fact, that's one of the reasons why many of the printers weren't really too happy about undertaking such a project because their press would be used for such a long period of time. Right. Those revelations built the church that we have today. They built the church. I use that intentionally, that powerful language. They literally built the church. It was here in this room that one of those landmark revelations was received. Doctrine and Covenants, section 76. Brigham Young, a few years later, when he first read that revelation, he says, why God's gonna save everybody. And he has a hard time with it. It takes Brigham Young some time to accept that. But even more than that, the fact that Joseph and Sidney claimed to see God the Father and Jesus Christ on his right hand, that's a pretty audacious statement. Mm -hmm. And that was a little difficult for them to accept. For Joseph Smith and the early Latter-day Saints, the 
primary purpose for the Kirtland Temple was to hold a special solemn assembly in the temple in which the ordained priesthood officers of the church would receive an endowment of power from on high. Joseph would locate or identify the site for the city of God, the, Jer the New Jerusalem. Right. And uh, in fact, he does. He uh, uh, arrives there uh, on the 14th of July, 1831, and uh, he'll receive a revelation identifying Jackson County as the, uh, the site for Zion and Independence as the center place. More than 1,500 saints assembled at this place. And at half past eight in the morning, after prayer, singing, and an address, they proceeded to break the ground for the Lord's house. The day was beautiful. The Spirit of the Lord was with us. An excavation for this great edifice 110 feet long by 80 feet broad was nearly finished. Uh, one Missourian said they dug the foundation to the depth of five feet in nearly one day. Now that's 110 feet by 80 feet. Now just by comparison, the Kirtland Temple was 79 feet by 59 feet. And the uh, Nauvoo Temple was 128 feet by 88 feet. The time of the saints in northern Missouri was short-lived. The Mormon war was literally that. It was a war uh, between the state of Missouri and the Mormons. It was, it's in the record books. From Liberty Jail, now the Lord tells him, you just don't need to worry about anybody. I'm with you. Uh, do what you have to do. And, and so what I believe is one of, uh, of of confidence goes to just fearless, raw courage. I really see Liberty Jail as a defining moment, a, a turning point, if you will, in Joseph's life. When Joseph left the jail, what in fact did he see as his priorities and what was his business to accomplish in Nauvoo? Clearly, the temple-centered city was the, the heart of it all. He also had a sense that Nauvoo was not a permanent place. It was a place to regroup, to survive, a place of refuge. But it wasn't even the place of refuge because Joseph Smith did understand how we don't know, he's never written this down, that there was a place of refuge preparing far away in the west, a place in the Rocky Mountains. In my estimation, the most tragic event in the history of the church was the murder of Joseph and Hiram Smith in the Carthage Jail on the 27th of June, 1844. Perhaps John Taylor summed up things the best when he wrote, they lived for glory, they died for glory, and glory is their eternal reward. From age to age shall their names go down to the posterity as gems of the sanctified. This is the Mormon Trail. This is near Muddy Creek Camp in Wyoming. It was across this trail that some 70,000 Latter-day Saint pioneers journeyed on their way to the Salt Lake Valley. You know, their story and their migration is unique, at least for the time. They didn't come in search of gold or furs or adventure as so many others did. And they didn't come one person here or a family there. They came as a people as an entire culture, if you will, in search of a place where they could live their holy religion and just be free. History of the saints gathering to the West, it's their story.
This series is about them. Through their journals, it will be as though they spoke from the dust, sharing their joys and their struggles on this trail. And with the help of informed scholars, we will bring you rare insights and perspectives on them and on this trail. All the way from Nauvoo, Illinois, to the Salt Lake Valley. When we talk about our history in any setting, in any detail, it all centers back on the prophet Joseph Smith, of course. And when we talk about Joseph Smith and his life, it comes to the matter of his death also. It was such a traumatic experience for so many people, and it was such a thunderbolt uh, in their lives. We don't have first-hand accounts at the time. Scores of people later recalled that his voice or his appearance or his mannerisms or something seemed to change and be just like those of Joseph Smith. Either the voice was like Joseph's, the mannerisms, or the authority with which he spoke was like Joseph Smith's. And uh, we use the phrase, the mantle of Joseph seemed to descend on Brigham Young. One could argue that virtually everything Brigham does is a footnote to what he saw Joseph do and what he saw Joseph uh, explain and teach. Once Joseph is dead, Brigham Young is convinced that when he goes west, he wants to take a people west who are in doubt. The problem is this uh, building completing, suddenly the Nauvoo Temple becomes the real uh, clue to anti-Mormon mobs that Mormonism is not dead, that Carthage and the death of Joseph and Hiram didn't end the church. And suddenly it's like every stone that goes up on that, uh, that temple says Mormonism has survived. The saints didn't act like they were going to leave. And by 1845, the anti-Mormon people were feeling like we've got to do something to stop their growth. More Mormons are moving in, they're building the temple, they're gonna be here. We've got to do something to, to see if we can remove them. I can remember thinking, you know, I sure would have been one of those saints that headed out on that trail. But that particular day of celebration, it was 20 degrees below. And I'm, I'm walking along Parley Street in high heels and suddenly, you know, I really thought and I go, I don't think I would have gone. Uh, I, I don't think I could have been in that first wave to be out there like John Taylor with a quilt thrown up over a tree as the only protection for his family when he left a beautiful brick structure in Nauvoo. Um, really, I, I'm not quite sure anything I could do in my life would be as faithful as their exit. Brigham was concerned that no one really knew the spot for fear someone would try to stop them from going there. As they head west, Brigham Young had very much hoped that the people would be prepared to go west. He had been telling the people, get your two years supply of food. But the problem he's going to face, the first saints leave in February. By May of 1846, just a few months later, he has 16,000 people in Iowa. The average person does not have a wagon and the average person has less than a two-week supply of food. One of the problems that Brigham Young and the Quorum of the Twelve are going to face is that they could get away from America, but they couldn't get away from their own people. Don't leave us behind. I mean, Joseph Smith never left us. You can't leave us. The Saints left Nauvoo in February of 1846. It took them about 120 days to travel that 310 miles. That was a terrible year 
in Iowa as far as the winter was concerned. The entire Mormon experience could have faltered on the plains of Iowa. There was one man who kept it together, and that man was uh, Brigham Young. After the saints were uh, leaving Nauvoo with Brigham Young, as they uh, left in February, they got as far as Elm Point in Iowa, and um, it became very clear that hundreds of the pioneers had already exhausted their supplies and their food, and that they really were not going to be able to cross the plains that season. And so uh, Brigham Young called a council, and they made a decision that they would establish some way station farms. On account of the vast amount of onions, the place was called Garden Grove. What we don't focus much on, and really is a magnificent chapter in the history of the church, is the fall exodus that comes about because of the Nauvoo War in September of 1846. A cannonball goes right through Emma Smith's house. Almost destroys the house. I mean, the saints are under attack. Long before the Martin Rescue Company, we have to talk about the Winter Quarters Rescue Company, about these 750 people who are being hunted out of Nauvoo. So where are they? They're in Montrose, Iowa. Right across from the city of Nauvoo. They don't have any wagons, they don't have any supplies, they don't have any conveyance. They're beginning, beginning to die. And of course, you remember in church history, the great miracle. Uh, which rivals that of the seagulls. And it is a miracle. It's written up in many contemporary journals when nothing on their tables except the flight of the quails. This is Lumen Andrus Shirtliff. He says, on the last day of October, 1846, we loaded, loaded in our in loads, loads near, near 60, 60 persons, persons and all they, and all they owned in the world and most of them sick. All the provisions put together would have made only one good meal, and we were now about to start in November with this poor, sick company on a journey of 170 miles through an uncivilized and mostly uninhabited wilderness. I felt like crying. Oh, God, help us. Lumen Shirley. The sacrifice of the saints at winter quarters in the fall and winter of 46 and 47 is unparalleled in church history. It was a valley forge in Mormon history. Here the saints were literally worn out, used up, and consigned to their graves in scores, and hundreds by disease, fatigue, destitution, and every ill of exile. Even though it was hard, they felt like it was a challenge. And they were saying, you know, I never thought I could do this before I was forced to do it. I could lay in the wagon and hear the wolves howl and, and the dogs bark and, and know that I could, I could do this now. And Eliza R. Snow, because of the fact that in winter quarters, the women had such a sisterhood and a bonding, they went around and took care of each other and uh, supported each other. They gave blessings to each other. And Eliza said, this is truly a glorious time for the sisters and daughters inside. So you have the two different ways of looking at winter quarters. I used to tell my students down at BYU, when the Mormons came west in 1847, a blind man could have followed that trail. And it's the truth, it could have been. I mean, it was, a, it was an open route and, and uh, I mean, when the Mormons came in 1847, uh, and it's already that visible, think of what it must have been like after 1847 when the real migration westward started in the 50s and the 60s. My gracious, no wonder you can go follow that route today. Some had a kind of complaining tone almost all the time through their diaries. They were, were committed to doing what they were doing, but they were a little bitter about this additional sacrifice that they were making. Others, uh, like Sarah Mousley, found everything exciting and new, and she dealt with the difficulties with always an optimistic spirit. We'll get over it and we'll move on. And some simply just observed with 
and wrote in beautiful detail the, the scenery that, through which they were passing. Many diaries never mention it, only if it posed a challenge to them. Others saw the beauty in it and the differences as they moved from the prairies and plains, the flatlands, uh, to the mountainous regions of Wyoming. Brigham did not seek a location that uh, might have been more prosperous, uh, like Oregon or like California. He wanted a place where he could make saints. When my eyes rested on the beautiful, entrancing sight, the valley, oh, how my heart swelled within me. I could have laughed and cried. Such a commingling of emotions I cannot describe. My soul was filled with thankfulness to God for bringing us to a place of rest and safety, a home. And Agatha Pratt, 1847. And that's our journey, all the way from Carthage Jail to the Valley of the Great Salt Lake. Come with us. If you love your history, well, then this is a show, a journey, an experience you're not going to want to miss. Voices from the Dust. And with that, I'm Glenn Lawson. See you next week.